The Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk Radio. Well, wouldn't you know it? Everybody's terribly excited about this reshuffle. People talk about Boris Johnson being in the prime position of his life, being in charge of the party, absolutely surrounding himself with Boris fans, making sure that all the people uh, who are closest to him now in the cabinet are, in fact, people that believe in his vision, uh, believe in what he wants to do, believe in supporting him and will forever be uh, part of his gang. Well, that's all very well. But to be honest, what does it mean to you and me? Because at the end of the day, let's not forget that we are still not very happy about the way that they've been rolling out the idea of vaccinating 12 to 15 year old children. We're still not happy about this nonsense that they might have to go backwards as we enter autumn because we must protect the NHS once again and COVID restrictions might have to be brought back in. We're still not happy about any of that. None of that has actually changed. You know, if we had uh, a, an opposition worth a fag end, something might have happened yesterday and maybe Sir Keir Starmer would have done something other than be shouted down by Boris Johnson. And I have to say, does perform very well at Prime Minister's questions when there's a full house of people because Starmer's just absolutely and utterly useless. But let's talk to William Clouston, leader of the Social Democratic Party, because he's always a voice of reason on these things and he's also got a view from outside of the metropolitan Westminster bubble. So let's ask William exactly what it all means. William, very good morning to you. Morning, Mike. I mean, I know that this is meat and drink for political analysts and for people uh, who enjoy you know, defenestrating and dissecting every single manoeuvre within Downing Street, watching people coming and going and seeing who's being put where. And it's all a bit, it's all a bit boring to most people, though, isn't it? Yeah, most of it's SW1 gossip um, that won't make any difference to people's lives at all. Um, I mean, there are two major changes here, Liz Trust to Foreign Secretary and, uh, and go to housing. Uh, go to housing is probably the more interesting one, but... Again, I mean, he's, a, he's an able man, Michael Gove, and he'll probably try and uh, help out. But unfortunately, the, the government's already lost two years on housing. Uh, they introduced this uh, white paper, tried to get some legislation through the Commons. The, their own Knights of the Shires have rebelled on it. So the zonal planning system that they wanted won't happen. They've lost two years. Uh, but the bigger problem, as always, Mike, is that the government, over the, various governments over the years, have, have, t have disarmed the, the state sector in housing. Mm. So even if Gove wanted to do something, he can't. Well, we've already seen, have we not, a sort of a rowing back, uh, which we might not be surprised to see, of the uh, supposedly shake-up of the planning laws, because the planning laws were meant to be taken on, weren't they, by this government? They were going to make it easier for houses to actually be built rather than more difficult for houses to be built, because there's no doubt that we need houses to be built in this country. Um, so unless he's going to completely reverse the latest reversal... Um, his, his hands are pretty tied, aren't they? Well, they're pretty tied, but honestly, Mike, the, more broadly on housing, they're tied because the Tory party is in the pocket of the big house builders. Yes. And that's been the case for a long time. If you look back to 2019, Electoral Commission's uh, details on, on donations, the Tory party received 11 million from the house building industry. So you won't get any major change until they stop being in the pocket of that vested interest. Um, but as I say, I mean, there's lots of interesting things could be done in in in, in housing, uh, and 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 you know, you'd have to get more state uh, um, uh, capacity there. You'd have to get a a government that actually wanted to build some houses and and so on. But I see no hint of it happening. So what you'll you'll have is a, probably a sharpened up uh, level of rhetoric on 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 levelling up. That's what that's the latest uh, slogan they've used. But remember, Mike, do you remember that the slogan they had previously, the Northern Powerhouse? Yes. All these things, I mean, basically the Tories, their focus is on the press and on sloganeering. There's nothing at all. I mean, there's very little from the Labour Party either. You don't confuse slogans with a proper industrial policy. No. Um, we, we think that you, to, to get to reindustrialize, to build the country back properly, you need to have some policies. You can't just do slogan sloganeering. Yeah, but this is the party and the government of slogans, isn't it? I mean, do you remember they used to have these three three word slogans every single week? They come up with a new one, you know, hands, face, space. Uh, then they yeah. had, uh, you know, build back better. You know, those are only really the first two that spring to mind. But I mean, that's mm. the trouble with modern politics is that it's all about slogans. You know, uh, America first. You know, uh, Northern Powerhouse. I mean, there's, there's, there's hordes of people being paid massive amounts of money to come up with this guff. But there's no long-term thinking, Mike, and no. there's no planning. I mean, they can't plan. In, in, in virtually no area is the government capable 
of, of setting out what it wants to do, getting a sensible industrial policy, which if it did, it would have to start training people, it would have to look at industrial capacity, it would, it would have an aim, a published aim probably, of getting manufacturing up from 9% to something like 15, it used to be 30 odd. Yeah. You'd have to have some, some policy, you'd have to have some trade policies. I mean, look at Liz Truss. Liz Truss was, was lauded for doing rollover deals uh, uh, on, on trade deals around the world, but very little scrutiny, Mike, of, of the detail of what she's actually done. Mm. Take, take one particular deal, the Japan deal from last year. The Japan deal, when you model it, will increase Japanese uh, exports to us by about 80%. It might, if we're lucky, increase uh, UK exports to Japan by about 21%. So that Liz Truss is being applauded for doing a trade deal which will increase our trade deficit. That's how bad the scrutiny is. And it's not just, I mean, and the government get away with it because there's very few serious people taking them on on this. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, until we get a government that's prepared to, to plan and, and do some long-term thinking, uh, you're always going to get this sloganeering and the sort of Westminster SW1 bubble of gossip about who's, who's Zooming who and so on. Yeah, well, exactly right. And I mean, the end of the day was even more really bizarre than the way it started, because we got the tip that there might be a reshuffle in the works quite early in the morning. But this kind of surprise 10 p.m. Um, press conference, I don't think I've seen a more bizarre thing uh, in a while. You know, Boris Johnson, Scott Morrison and Joe Biden all doing what apparently didn't really seem to be much of a of a of a, of a, of a, of a, of a I don't know, an intentional press conference it looked as if they'd sort of hurriedly put something together um and they didn't and all they seemed to make us want to believe was that don't worry yes these are nuclear powered submarines but they haven't got any nuclear weapons on them and that was what they kept repeating and i was kind of going why are you even doing this yeah it's slightly odd i mean actually in reality something like this couldn't have happened overnight uh you know i mean it would have had to involve quite a lot of discussion and actually a a, a formalized defense pact between Australia, uh, you know, and ourselves in the United States is a very good idea. I, I actually support it. I think it's a good idea. Oh, yeah, I think in principle what they're doing is probably smart, but I don't understand yeah. why they announced it the way that they did. No, it's just strange. It was quite, it was cobbled together. I mean, it was, it, it was in the industry, you must think that, you know, yesterday was a pretty heavy news day. Mm. I mean, you had a lot going on and, and, and that was an important thing. But as I say, it's quite important. I mean, I, you know, as you know, I've said before, you know, we're an Anglo-Australian family. We, I, I, I think it's a very good link up. As the world turns, Mike, we're going to have to um, form strong relationships with people that view the word world basically as we do. Mm. Uh, so I'd support it. I, as I say, I think it's it's uh, it's it's Scotty from marketing's probably boosted his chances of re-election. <laughs> yes, I think that's absolutely right. But let's look at what this week has done for for Boris Johnson, because people are now saying. He's surrounding himself with, with uh, you know, people who are on his side. Um, whether they were Remainers or not is, is less important now than it used to be. Um, he appears to those inside the Westminster bubble as now unassailable. And it might be that he's, he is. But outside of the Westminster bubble, where you live, for example, what are people actually saying about the Tories? Well, I think the problem is that the, 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 the red wall, as it's called, rejected um, Labour for mainly for cultural reasons and Brexit, you know, for betraying. I mean, you know, we, we didn't ask for very much, Mike. We just thought we might want to govern ourselves. And Labour went against that and yeah. went against the vote. So the, the, the peel off from Labour culturally was already happening. The problem with the Tories is that really they don't they don't really sit on top of this red wall. I mean, as I, as I said, on detail like. Uh, you know the Japan trade deal and things. It, it isn't. It isn't actually in our interest to do that. And if they were serious about manufacturing, they'd have to, to look at um, uh, tax incentives for uh, for research and development and start training people. And they'd have to have a competitive um, exchange rate. None of the Tories won't talk about any of this. Mm. So, you know, where will it matter? I mean, and look at another example: fishing. Um, you know, a sensible government. Well, now as we've got theoretically le legal control of our, our, our uh, onshore our, 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 our waters back we could build up the british fish fishing industry if we wanted to and there's no sign from george eustace uh in his department for doing it so what will happen to for hartlepool and south shields and north shields and the rest of us uh come come the you know three or three three uh, four year deadline uh on fishing um we won't have the capacity to fish our own waters and we'll let others do it for us and that's the lack that's the type of lack of ambition that you get from the government they're very good at sloganeering but if they wanted to to address that particular industry for our region 
Greg Grimsby right up to Lossiemouth. They'd have to start. They'd have to have a plan, Mike. That's my point. They'd have to have a plan to get this, get get the capacity up, not just to to, to fish, but to process the fish on shore. And they haven't done that. So yeah. that's just another example. Well, that's right. And Prissy Patel survives the uh, the reshuffle. A lot yeah. of people wondering why. The answer is very obvious. She's popular with the party. But Boris Johnson likes her and doesn't wish to shove her out of the way. But I mean, talk yeah. about slogans and not very much action. You know, she's failed to control uh, the borders. She's failed to stop the illegal migrants from coming in. She's failed uh, to reform the police uh, into some kind of actual force that can be reckoned with. They're still going around, and we'll be talking later to Norman Brennan about this, asking protesters if there's anything they need. I mean, you know, they should be hurling these people off onto the uh, onto the hard shoulder, shouldn't they? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any way Pretty Patel was, would, would lose her job. She's very, very popular with ordinary members of the Tory party. And actually, to be fair to her, I think her instincts on migration are probably right. But the problem is that as an entity, the Tory party seemed utterly inept in terms of dealing with it. So they are running an open borders policy. You've got a thousand people arriving illegally some days and the Tories have done nothing about it. And if you have a Tory majority of over 80 and they've done nothing about it, it just means they don't actually want to do anything about it. Mm. That's, that's the reality. So, yeah, I mean, I, and again, look at, look at the recent news on, 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 on the migrant crossings in the channel. Uh, Pretty Patel is, is, is focused on uh, trying to blame the French, trying to turn boats back. Both of these things are, are irrelevant. If you had a decent policy in place, you'd be able to deal with it. And mm. a decent policy is, funnily enough, is the Australian policy, which is that you, you have to stop it. You have to stop the trade by disincentivising people from even trying. And we keep being told that the Australian policy is the one to copy. And we keep saying it and we keep hearing it and we keep hearing other people repeat it. But still, it doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen because, as I say, I think, they, I think Mike, they just lack, they, they don't have the bottle to deal with this. You, you, you know, we're on our own in this. The, the, if, you, if you have a thousand people just rocking up a, a day and those are the ones you know about you're running an open borders mm. policy you're actually destroying the social contract people are rocking up and gaining access to a welfare state that they haven't paid for and and, the, and 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 the people are very frustrated about it but i would say don't bother turning uh, your attention to the tories and labor would have a probably a worse policy on this oh i'm sure they would but that's part of the problem but stay where you are because we're going to come back to that as to what the labor party should be doing because they're having their conference pretty soon and we want to find out exactly what it is that they stand for. Uh, we're talking to William Clouston. We will, of course, take your calls as well. 0344 499 1000. I want to know today uh, what it is that makes a difference to you in your life that Westminster should be doing, because it's all very well speculating about, you know, who's up, who's down, who's got a new job, who's got a promotion, who's been uh, uh, put out into the pastures. You know, I don't think anybody cares much about that outside of the Westminster bubble. But I'd love to hear from you, because I know that you are much more politically attuned to the way things are in this country than most people think. The people who listen to this show are very much aware of what is going on around them and are also very much aware and very good at producing voting patterns which actually get the right results. 0344 499 1000 is the number. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republican, Mike Graham. I have lost a briefcase, right? So I'm going to be putting out an APB for it later on. Uh, I'm going to be putting out a picture of it to show you precisely what it looks like so that if you happen to see it, uh, you'll be able to bring it here to the headquarters of Common Sense at News UK. It's a very complicated story. I'll get into it later on. Right now, we're talking about far more important things uh, with William Clouston, leader of the Social Democratic Party. William, um, I thought... Yesterday, Sir Keir Starmer showed why he can't be for very much longer the leader of the opposition, because he can't handle Boris Johnson in that sort of raucous um, gladiatorial uh, arena, which is the House of Commons when it's full of people. He just doesn't seem to have a clue how to do it. No, he didn't do very well. I mean, it, it, occasionally when it's more forensic um, and he's asking him detailed questions in an empty parliament, he's done reasonably well. But no, it's not going very well. I mean, he, he's got a, an impossible job, Starmer, because the voters he needs to attract, um, he can't attract because of his party and his parliamentary party and his own members and their own preoccupations. So he'll never be able to do that. And I think he'll, whatever happens, pretty much he'll, he'll lose the next election. And, uh, and I don't think Labour on the, on the electoral dynamics can actually win uh, without Scotland. And lost Scotland is it's probably one of the most important things that's happened in politics in the last sort of uh, 10, 15 years. Mm. 
And I mean, and if that is the case, you know, Boris Johnson has every reason to be very full of himself, doesn't he? Because if he has insulated himself within the party itself, whereby he is unassailable, and unless he does something really stupid, and in his case, it does appear that it would have to be something incredibly stupid and possibly illegal uh, to, to, mm. to lose his, his position in, in the party as its leader. Um, mm. He can pretty much stay in for as long as he wants. And maybe he will end up staying in longer than Margaret Thatcher. I don't know about that. I don't think he's a terribly competent person. Um, I think he was very useful to get Brexit across the line, but... I don't think he's interested in detail. Um, he, yeah, we he... keep hearing this, though, William. And yet here he is, having just made probably the most, um, uh, shall we say, decisive cabinet reshuffle in his own image. That's what people are saying it is. I don't know about that. I think it's, I mean, it wasn't, it's not the light of nice, the long knives. It's not like Macmillan. It's, it's, you've made two major changes. And the other changes he's made, people like Williamson, was not competent to do the job. So he had to make that change. Mm. Uh, he, you know, removed Rab and put a Tory party favourite in uh, the FCO, OK, and then he gave Rab a biscuit with, uh, you know, Deputy Prime Minister. So this is, it's not actually particularly interesting, this reshuffle. No, I think the, I think Johnson is very vulnerable, actually, um, from, from Sunak. <laughs> I think it's obvious that as, as soon as, I mean, it, it really depends. The Tory party is pretty ruthless in getting rid of people if they feel they can't win. Mm. Um, it largely will be down to the polls. And as, as Matt Goodwin is excellent on Twitter, at sharing all the, all the recent polls, the polls have narrowed recently. So we'll see how we go. But as I said, I mean, Labour can't win on the electoral dynamics. It doesn't, it's lost all its seats in Scotland. It's losing the red wall. It may pick a few, uh, you know, so-called blue wall seats up, but Starmer can't do anything about that. And he can't reposition his party to occupy the space which is the sort of patriotic left space because they're not very patriotic and i say i've said before starmer's biggest problem is that you can't spend three and a half years being the architect to uh, undermine the biggest vote in british political history and then suddenly get a british flag behind you and pretend that you believe in the country people just won't believe it no, and people aren't buying it. But I wonder, in those red wall seats, whether people up there who said that they were loaning their vote to the Tories might just desert the Tories and go somewhere else, which might let Labour in, depending on who else is standing. I think a lot depends, Mike, on how the economy goes. Um, uh, you know, look at wage rates, for instance. Wages are, are increasing. Uh, the employment market's tighter. It's not just lorry drivers, industrial workers. A lot of other people are being paid more. And we've argued for a long time that uh, a consequence of having open borders, you know, an open uh, labour markets in the EU was was to suppress wages, mm. industrial wages and lower uh, low skilled wages. And we've said it for ages and the Labour Party and a lot of the free traders uh, couldn't believe it. And it's happened. I mean, it's actually happening. Mm. You know, you've got a tighter labour market. Employers have to pay people a bit more. And that will encourage a lot of red wall voters. So I think things like that probably will help the Tories. But it really, I mean, I think I suspect there'll be a, an election in, in in something like, you know, two years time. You know, yeah, that's uh, what I think. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's the likely date. Uh, the question is, if Boris Johnson does reasonably well between now and then, he'll be leading the Tories into that election. And if he doesn't, Sunak will. Yes, I think that's about right. But the one thing I suppose in Boris's favour as well is that one thing he is pretty good at is winning elections. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I, if whatever say whatever you say about Boris Johnson, you cannot under, underestimate him as a communicator and as an effective politician. He's an extremely effective politician. I think, uh, you know, the, look at the Tories now in London, it's not going so well. But I mean, remember, he, you know, he, he won the mayoral election for the Tories. And that, to, uh, to be honest, Mike, now that's pretty unthinkable. Yeah, well, I mean, one place where Labour's doing well is, of course, in the leafy, rather wealthy areas of London. You know, which tells you an awful lot, doesn't it? You know, the Labour Party is no longer the party of the working class. It's the party of the chattering classes uh, and the laptop working from home brigade. Yeah, no, the, the, the Labour Party represents now rather like, as I've said before, it's like a big version of the Liberal Democrats. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's most of their members are, are graduates, degree holders. They represent uh, a, a sort of open, liberal, progressive view of the world. And you have to be pretty well off to uh, to to afford that. Mm. 
Of course. And you have to be very, very well off to be able to welcome into the uh, the country uh, the sort of policies that Sir Keir Starmer would be proposing. But, but William, as ever, thank you for talking to us. William Clouston, leader of the Social Democratic Party. He thinks there could be an election within a couple of years. I think he's probably right. I think there's no doubt that the Tory party is constantly on the lookout for how to gain an edge.